Welcome back to another weekly Ask GMBN Tech Show. Get your questions in in the comments underneath. Use that hashtag Ask GMBN Tech. Anything mountain biking related goes. If we can help you fix your bike up, we'd love to. So uh, get involved. Now, first question's from Philippe. Now, this one says, can I help um, or can I loop my KS Lev Integra dropper post with normal bearing grease or do I need a special one? Okay, so think of your dropper post as a suspension seat post rather than just a dropper post. It works in the same way as suspension components. It has bushings on the inside, it has a seal in it, it has suspension fluid in it, it has an IFP in there. Basically, it is a suspension unit, except it's designed to stay up and, uh, and down, basically in different positions. So accordingly, you wanna be using suspension safe grease. Now bearing grease, some bearing grease is safe for use on suspension items. Now, if you look on this one here, it says high performance grease, perfect for high end applications, including precision ground and ceramic bearings, pivots and suspension components. So technically this one you could, but not a lot of regular greases is a good idea to put on suspension components. So what we'd recommend is a suspension oil or a specific suspension grease. Now this stuff is very slick and it's much thinner. So think about the operation of your post. If you put a big, thick, congealing grease in it, you could actually slow it down. You want something nice and fast and runny. It's actually gonna stay in place quite well. So look to suspension if you wanna be maintaining your dropper post, basically. Next up is from Alien Man. Hi, I'm from Alien Man, interesting. Uh, hi, I'm from the Philippines. Any plans uh, to bike around Asian countries for a vlog, uh, bike travel in the future? I've been watching all your videos here, uh, more studying than biking, making things balanced for the first stages, knowing is good foundation. Do you know what, I'd, I'd love to return to Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, a few years back, me and my wife traveled around for a few months. We did, what did we do? We did Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, um, Vietnam, Indonesia, and we actually tried to, to go up to the Philippines, but we were too early in the year. We were gonna go from, um, I think, around Lombok and Indonesia area. We were gonna travel up to Komodo to see the Komodo dragons and stay on the island and then continue north up to the Philippines, but we never got there on that trip. So I would absolutely love to go back. You know, actually, when we were in Thailand, when we were in uh, Chiang Mai, which is up north, we noticed there's actually quite a big mountain biking scene there. And although we were there for a, like a bit of a backpacking holiday, um, I really wanted a bike at the time, I would absolutely love to. So if there's any mountain bikers out there from Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Philippines, we'd love to hear from you actually. Give us some recommendations on what's out there because uh, it's actually quite unknown for us in terms of mountain biking. Um, count me in, if there's an option, I'm there. I'd go tomorrow, I really would. I absolutely love that part of the world uh, and I've only got really fond memories. And actually, I went back to Thailand, it must be probably about a year ago actually, but it was only to Bangkok to visit the, the Lion Tires factory, which is owned by Victoria. And although we were just in Bangkok, just the smell getting off the plane, the humidity, the heat, um, you know, it's obviously it was really uncomfortable for a Westerner like myself to, to go there. It takes you a few days to adjust to it. And on that trip, it's straight off the plane, straight into a factory, which was like 50 degrees, uh, which for me, I was basically melting in there, but I loved every second of it. Um, yeah, fond memories. Count me in if there's an option out there and let us know what's going on. There's obviously some industry out there. So from a tech point of view, we could be visiting those. And I do hear that there is a bike show happening in Bangkok. So maybe I need to return to that. Um, but yeah, thanks for getting in touch. We're gonna be traveling a lot in 2021, making up for this bizarre year that we've had. So um, see you hopefully in the Philippines at some point. Uh, next up from Surrey C69. Um, can I marry SRAM brakes with uh, Shimano iSpec EV shifters? There is no such adapter on the market at the moment. There must be some sort of hack or bodge. Hold on, there is. There 100% is. Give me a second, I, I have actually seen one. Um, Oh God, wouldn't even, it, was, it was a bizarre name. It's like, um, hold on a second. Actually, bear with me a second. I saw this not too long ago because I was looking for something similar. Here you go, uh, Problem Solvers. That's what the brand is called. Look up problemsolversbike.com. There's a link at the bottom of the screen. Now they make, um, let me click on the right one here. I'm gonna throw a link up on screen. It's rare to actually do this live on camera, but um, yeah, here we go. It's called Mismatch. Right hand iSpec 2, so Mismatch adapters allow users to match Shimano and SRAM brakes and shifters on one clamp, freeing up valuable handlebar space. 
there you go, thank me later. Um, I'm sure there's loads of different options of things they do on there, but it doesn't seem that anyone else does. I'm quite surprised. I would have thought something like Wolf Tooth or maybe Reverse Components, one of those sort of companies that produce those sorts of things would. So if anyone knows actually out there of any other brands that do sort of adapters to run, you know, SRAM or Shimano shifters on different components and different brakes, it'd be really helpful to know actually. So yeah, let us know in those comments underneath. Um, next up, should I pump my tires up more than I use on the trails for when going for a spin around the city, stairs, curbs, uh, jibbing, or leave the same? I'm using inserts and around 26 to 28 PSI and heavy duty tires. Um, it's entirely up to you, it depends what you want to get out of the bike. Now I've, I commute, I have got a commuter bike with full length mud guards and slicks on it, but I prefer to just ride my regular mountain bikes. Um, to be honest, it's only when it's really bad weather I tend to ride that, that bike. Now I always run my bikes um, much firmer PSI. So I think at the moment I'm running a mega and I've probably got 40 pounds front and rear in those tires just to ride it to work because obviously it's a big travel bike. It's got very soft, sticky rubber tires on there. Off-road, I'll be anything from 23 to 26 PSI in the front and 28 to 31 in the rear. So I do play around with that. So best advice actually is get yourself um, a digital tire pressure gauge basically and play around with your tire pressure. It's kind of fun and obviously if you're going to be jumping down like double flights of stairs and stuff, you do, you know, you're reducing the risk of damaging stuff on your bike as well. So um, yeah, give it a try and see what works out for you. Okay, next up is from Scott O'Hare. Why are there no short travel double crown forks? Would the negatives outweigh the positives? Hmm, that's interesting. I think probably because they're not needed. I mean, look at that bad boy up there. So that is a RockShox Totem from about 2007. It's got, I think it's got seven inches of travel, 40 millimeter stanchions on it, um, a 1.5 inch steerer tube. And you know, although that's quite an old fork and their latest fork's got 38 mil stanchions, it's smaller you are starting to see bigger steerer tubes coming back. There's a 1.8 in the e-bike world now, which I've still not checked out, so I will have a look at that. But um, it's simply not necessary to have that much extra material. So on a twin crown fork, we'll, we'll use this RockShox Boxer as an example. You have those upper legs and the upper crown on there as support as well. So you've got this massive long travel fork up to 200 mil travel on the front of your bike. You think how much leverage that can have on the head tube and the front of the bike, as well as on the actual fork itself, unless you're gonna overbuild it like that. The way to keep it, keep the weight down, basically without overbuilding it like the old totems, um, is ultimately to put a separate crown on the top. You're spreading out that load, but also if it's running coil springs, you can have longer coil springs in there. You can have more oil on the inside of the fork. You can have better damping capabilities. That's why all downhill forks tend to be twin crown, but simply not necessary um, on trail forks. You know, as you see, you can have up to 190 mil travel now on a single crown fork, which just sounds crazy. Um, you know, I've been riding since got a set of Zebs on that bike over there. Um, and it just seems nuts how much travel you can have and how stiff it can be without the, the additional weight. That said, I did once have a set of Stratos FR4 forks, which had 100 millimeters of travel. They were designed as a sort of a dual slalom fork, um, but they were pretty basic. The damping wasn't that good in them and I actually snapped them clean in half, uh, which was the sort of the lead into my career as a journalist actually in the cycling world because I was testing them for a magazine called Mountain Biking UK. I snapped them and broke my cheek, my eye socket and my nose and I lost most of my hair, my ear nearly came off in the, in the accident as well as I slid down the road. Um, so just goes to show, you know, you make something a twin ground, doesn't necessarily make it a good reason. And funnily enough, I think they, um, they disappeared from the market fairly soon after that one. But uh, yeah, you don't need them basically. Uh, next up is from Daz uh, Zenkel. Sorry, I couldn't pronounce your name there. Uh, Hello, Doddy. I bought my first suspension bike recently with a Marzocchi Z2 fork. Nice. 130mm travel. I set it to 25% sag, but even with a 70 cm uh, huck to flat, 70 meters, you'd be a very strange person, um, uses around 90 millimeters of travel. Okay, so you're not using all your travel. Is this due to the compression? Maybe I could release some air or should I bring the fork to the bike shop? Uh, furthermore, my dropper post with 170mm drop is a bit short for me. Uh, have you got any recommendations? A very longer one. Wow, you must be really tall if 170mm drop drop post is too short for you. Uh, there's a few 200mm posts on the market. Uh, you know, Crank Brothers do them. There are, uh, honestly, off the top of my head, I can't think there's so many people do great dropper posts now. But with the fork, so 130mm travel, you're using around 90mm travel. So a 70 centimeter huck to flat, that's not that high. 
Now, I, I wouldn't expect on my bike to use all my travel on a drop like that. Perhaps jumping off something the height of this, which um, I haven't got to take measure at hand to measure it, but it's a lot higher than 70 centimetres, that's for sure. Um, I might expect to get close. But you've got to bear in mind as well, suspension bikes and suspension forks are all very different. Now, the old way of setting up suspension basically insisted that on every average ride, you should be using all of your travel. Now, whilst this is good because you're kind of maximizing on the use of your fork, there's no margin for error there. So on most average rides, you're not going to be jumping off anything crazy or going through a wild rock garden and fearing for your life or anything. The way we set up suspension now is very different. So suspension tends to be more progressive, so it does get firmer towards the end of travel. That's a good thing. Now, it's pretty rare that I use all of my travel on a bike. In fact, if you look at the O-rings on my fork and shock right now, you'll see they're not even fully at the end. And that was jumped quite heavily fairly recently. Um, there's about, I don't know, there's a, probably 10 mil left on the shock shaft and probably about 20 on the front fork, which I run a little bit firmer than the rear end. That's about right. I'm using a lot of travel on there, but there's a little bit left for those, oh my God, moments. Um, you don't want to be using all your travel all the time. But if your fork does feel too firm for you at that, then yeah, just let the pressure down a bit, experiment. And the best way to do that is to go and ride a trail that you know really well. It doesn't need to be a whole trail, just a section that you know feels bumpy and lumpy and all of the good stuff that you enjoy riding. Before you ride it, set the O-ring down against the seal, go and ride that section of trail um, a few times and just see where the O-ring ends up. If you're using around two thirds of the travel, that's probably about right. But who am I to tell you that? Because it is down to personal preference. If it feels too harsh for you, then yeah, maybe you want it a little bit softer. And if you're if you're comfortable with the two thirds and then having that extra for the bigger jumps and drops, so be it. But um, experiment, that's the name of the game with suspension because no one setup is perfect for every rider. That's the cool thing about it. You know, you can experiment and find what works for you. Uh, and I hope you get there soon. Next up's from Carl. Hey Doddy, what is free ride? Um, examples of bikes, events, riders, and general idea and origins. Wow, that's a hell of a question. Okay, so where should we start? So when mountain biking started, there was only really cross country riding. And when you weren't doing your cross country race, people used to mess around, you know, ride down hills, uh, do a bit of slalom, a bit of trials, and they kind of turned into parts of the sport um, as it sort of fragmented into different areas. So you had trials, uh, you had slalom, and then of course you had downhill, which was just a time trial. And in those early days, you did it all on the same bike. You might lower your saddle or take your bar ends off, but other than that, it was pretty much the same. But as each of those things started getting a little bit more specialist, the bike technology started developing towards this. But the problem was it was all very focused on competition. And competition isn't necessarily what everyone wants to do. Now you look at any sport, there's always a freestyle element to this. You get this in swimming, you get this, you get free ride in skiing and snowboarding. And that's basically exactly what happened in mountain biking. Now in the 90s, there were, well, they're still around now, uh, Wade Simmons, Richie Schley, and Brett Tippy are arguably some of the first free riders out there. Now they all have skiing and snowboarding backgrounds between them. And they were basically riding these big scree slopes in, I think it was Kamloops in Canada, um, in the same way that you'd see skiers carving down these slopes. And pretty much they gave birth to, to free ride off the back of that. And we started realizing that it was a side of the sport that wasn't competing, that you're going out and riding wild terrain, um, and it fragmented off as a whole separate thing. Now, nowadays, free ride can be a lot of things. It could be dirt jumping, it could be like the Fest series stuff, it could be a slope style comp, um, Red Bull Rampage. There are loads of different styles of competition of free ride, but the whole thing with free ride is there is no defined style. It's what you interpret and what you want to do. Uh, look at the 50 to one guys. In fact, there's an Instagram clip right here of Josh Lewis doing stuff. That's free ride. You know, some people are calling it jibbing, messing around in the woods, but it's free ride. You're expressing yourself in the way that you want to. Now, as far as bike technology goes, the earlier free ride brands that really took a hold of this with brands like Norco, brands like Rocky Mountain. Uh, Norco, of course, had the Shore and the A-Line. Both bikes dedicated to having fun and with no race intention, with the big travel, strong bikes for jumping off stuff and surviving. Rocky Mountain had the same, they had the RM7, the RM9, early versions of the Slayer. Um, th there's just far too many. In fact, I'm gonna throw you to a film to watch. It's called Moment Movie, uh, directed by Darcy Turenne. Actually, I lie, her name was Darcy Turenne. She's since married, I forget her surname now. I'm so sorry, Darcy. Um, 
I haven't met Darcy for a long time now. It's an incredible film. I uh, highly recommend it. It's a screen grab on screen at the moment, and there should be a link in the description underneath where you can watch it. I think it might be on iTunes, but I'm sure there's other ways you can see it. It's brilliant, and it documents how that free ride movement started in Canada. Uh, honestly, it's one of the coolest bike videos I've ever seen, and I think it's largely gone under the radar because people get a bit, a bit obsessed with, with competition and racing. You know, that kind of steals the show a lot of the times but her film is absolutely fantastic and it will make you laugh. There's some incredible stories and you will not believe what those early free riders like Brett Tippy were riding down on the bikes that they were. Some of that stuff you'd question doing it now on like a 180 mil travel modern enduro bike. Honestly, absolutely bonkers crazy. Really good bit of education as well. In fact, I'm gonna watch it after this. Uh, next up is from John Jed. Hey Donnie, has any of you guys have have any one of you guys had issues with micro spline hubs? Apparently, I've destroyed three hubs two DRXT hubs, um, two DRXT M8000s. At first, I thought it was just a factory defect of some sort, bad apple in a bunch, so I purchased another one. Guess what? Same thing happened. Uh, I also purchased a DeBomb UFO 148 boost hub and also destroyed that. Doesn't sound like a coincidence to me. Dude, what are you doing? Right, let's have a look at these pictures. Okay, so on screen, there are a couple of pictures here. The John, I, I can't quite work out what you've done. Uh, I'm now thinking of buying a DC Swiss 240 hub since it has a ratchet type 3 hub. Do you think it's worth it and better than a pool type hub? Okay, well, my own feelings on that are like, I have no idea what you've done by the way to do this because uh, it looks like you've just completely mashed up the insides of the hubs. Um, it'd be hard to see without actually seeing them in the flesh. And I would genuinely like to know if you can take them to a bike shop mechanic, someone can actually look at them and tell me what's happened. I'm keen to find out myself. But generally I say that a ratchet type hub is gonna be better in high torque applications. So uh, it could be on an e-bike or it could be with one of those huge cassettes that's putting all that extra torque into the hub. Now, yeah, okay, arguably the pool type thing works brilliantly. However, they can still fail. And what I mean by fail is that they can get gunked up with mud and stuff and then the pools don't actually click into place. Then they're gonna rotate around and then in this case, they're gonna be slipping, which means they're gonna mash up the internal gearing. So that could be what happened to yours. Uh, there's much less chance of that happening with the ratchet drive hubs because of the way the springs work on them. They don't get clogged up by mud. Um, and they're always partially engaged. Uh, it's a really good system, as you can see by this little clip on screen. So um, I would say if that's what's happened for you disintegrating your hubs, which um, I'm sorry you have, it's kind of funny because I've not seen this before. It feels like something Blake should do, but he, he normally just breaks things instead. No, um, sorry, I don't know what you've done, to be honest. Um, I'm completely, I have no idea. Sorry, dude. Um, but I do think in your case, if that's what you've done, a ratchet hub would be better. If anyone else has had that same issue with, with any brand, just with micro spline hubs and mashing up the insides, let us know. Uh, what bike was it on? What gearing are you running? Uh, is it an e-bike? You know, um, how did it happen? When, you know, when did you notice problems with it? Uh, we're keen to try and find these problems out so we can maybe help try and fix them. Let us know in those comments. Get your questions in for the next show and uh, we'll catch you then. See you later.